Well, 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 a TV show that's a prequel to the excellent Star Wars film Rogue One and further chronicles the beginnings of the Rebel Alliance. All I could say is, yes, please. Howdy. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, and this is the Q&A. My agenda is simple. Each week, I plan to bring you in-depth insights into the creative process of storytelling. And wow, folks, today, I am quite pleased to have with me the creator and showrunner and co-writer of Andor. That's Tony Gilroy. And I really love what he has done with this show. As I'm sure you know, this Disney Plus Star Wars show is a prequel to the 2016 movie Rogue One, which Tony Gilroy also wrote on. This podcast will, of course, exist examine the first four episodes of the show because that's all I've seen at this point and hopefully we'll sit down for another chat with Tony again and what I love about this TV show so much is it really shows you just how big the Star Wars universe can be and how far away from the more treaded paths we can go to explore it. Tony was very forthcoming about his creative habit, how he works with the studio and his co-writers, and what it took to get Andor in the can, so I know you'll dig this episode. And speaking of things to dig, Backstory Magazine turns 10. That's right, we survived a decade and we couldn't have done it without your help. And the other good news is that we just released a new issue. Yes, issue 47, our summer issue, is live, and there is so so much great stuff in it. I hope you check out the table contents to see it all, but we have Emmy Awards contenders ranging from Stranger Things, Better Call Saul, Station Eleven, Barry, Hacks, and what we do in the shadows to summer movies, to new scripts for you to read, to an interview with director John Carpenter on the 40th anniversary of The Thing. Man, there are so many great things in this issue, and I hope you check it out. If you have never read us before, you can, of course, test drive us over at Backstory.net and read the free issue, or you could use the iPad app backstory where you could read the free issue there as well. And if you like what you see, and I hope you do, you could consider becoming a subscriber. And to sweeten the deal, I want to give you discount coupon code SAVE5. That will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. The code will work at backstory.net and you enter it there in your checkout cart, but it'll give you access to both backstory.net and the iPad app as well. So, you know, it's two for one. You get access to both easily. But look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube channel, which is all these Zoom cast go of these interviews. So you could see us do the interviews. You don't have to just hear us, but it would really mean a lot to me to have you subscribe to my passion project. So thanks for considering. But now without any further ado, let's jump right into our interview with creator, co-writer and producer. Producer Tony Gilroy about his latest show, Andor, on Disney Plus. Tony, good to see you. I absolutely love Andor, so I can't wait to talk about it. Nice to be here. Before we talk about it, I do want to flash back a little, and I've interviewed you quite a few times before, but uh, I think it would be an interesting place to start to hear about the one that got away. You're a working writer at the top of your game. Everybody loves your talents. There's always projects that writers try and set up that they put their heart into. And I'm curious if there's any projects like that that you want to tell us about that are kind of sitting out there, either trapped in development hell or something that you're hoping one day still might get made. Man, that is a long list of projects. I mean, you, get, sure. to be, you get to be my age and you get you've, you've been busy. I mean, everybody who's like me has there's a whole stack of projects that didn't get made and they fall into several categories. They fall into ones where they were really important to you. And you go back and look and the time is the time has passed. You know, the, the issue is over. It's it's not the moment for that anymore. There's ones that you go back and look at and go, ah, oh, you know what? I see what the problems were that I couldn't see before. There's some that are just are inexplicable. That are some that they're just so there was something so complicated and daunting about them that you 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 can't believe that you were so vainglorious that you thought they would ever get made in the first place. <laughs> you know, and there's just some heartbreakers. It, there's really a a lot of projects I would say. But I mean, if you well, wanted to single out one or two that could still get made, they're not a product of their time. There's a timeless uh, aspect. You know, I'll, I'll talk about a project that Danny and I wrote together. It, it, it really is probably the, one of the best things that we ever worked on. I, I certainly know it's the best thing that we ever collaborated on. We were both just so terrifically excited about it. And it was a really quixotic journey. We did a movie about, it'll sound insane, when you, the, the, about the last uh, executioner of the, the, the last concierge of the guillotine in France. So we, <laughs> we, we did a show that we that a lot of interest in it along the way different times it's, it's 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 really our finest writing in a way it's called monsieur de paris man we worked on that we've worked on it twice i don't even know for a couple of years we've worked on it and we wrote 
I wrote two two full episodes. Danny wrote a full episode. We wrote a massive long Bible. We really poured our asses into it. And it's a show about a real story about the family the and the, the community, the people that ran, ended up running the guillotine. It was a sort of single family that ended up, tribal family that had been winnowed down over years into one family. And the last public execution is 1939. In, and so the show was going to run from 1917 through 1939. Oh, wow. And it was an incredibly ambitious show oh. with, a, with a really difficult problem in it in that it was so real and so wanted to be so vibrant and crazy and real. And yet we were writing in English. And in the end, the show would be in France. And the linguistic aspect of it was just why we didn't fully vet out how that would play between us because we disagreed about how to do it and how difficult it would be to be. So that's a project that that sits there. It's a beautiful, I, I love having it. I love look every time I look at it, I'm blown away by what I we hope did. you revive it. I, I, it sounds I, fantastic. I don't know. It needs to be, we finally decided a couple of years ago, it needs to be a fully French production and we needed to really find some you know, we really, we needed to turn it over to Jacques Odiard and have them take, you know, we needed a French showrunner to take yeah. it over and do it. And we haven't had success with that, but that's one. I mean, that was a big project, but that there are fantastic. so many, Jeff. There are so many. I, I know, I know. That's a, that sounds fantastic. And for our podcast listeners out there, of course, the Danny he is talking about is, is Dan, Gilroy. Dan Gilroy, who is the writer director of Nightcrawler. We absolutely love Dan. He's done a lot of other things and he's on Andor as well, which is great. I'll tell you one last thing. Please. Is that... A couple of years ago, and I'm not going to talk about the, this project, but I had a, I had a project really shot out from under me after a long period of time, and I was really pissed off and really upset, and it was like a lot of things were not working out. It was prior to coming on this, right? And I and I and I called my agent at one point. I go, you know what I'm going to do? All the scripts that I wrote that I love that I own that never got made, I own them. This is like six or seven of them. I said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to put them on the web. I'm just going to post them. I was going to get a website and put them up and just have them just sit up there. And she freaked out. Don't you dare do that. Don't you ever do that. You should put your agent on the phone with me because at Backstory Magazine, which I publish, we do run blacklist scripts from the blacklist, which are unproduced screenplays by writers of note. And we interview them about it. And the whole purpose is to actually try and get new attention on the scripts for them with the hope that they will get made. So tell your agent to give me a buzz because. All right. Well, we'll see about that. But anyway, yeah. as you know, everybody has a lot of them. Absolutely. We, we are we are happy to run them anytime. But, you know, I want to I want to talk about another kind of wild riding ride you went on. It was 2016's Rogue One. You and Chris White share screenplay credit. John Knoll and Gary Witta have story by credit. And they had each written a script before then. And I know that you you came on at a certain point. It seems like it was in production. There's been a lot of chatter about it over the years. I'm just curious because Rogue One leads into Andor. What could you tell us about coming in and just some of the things that you added? I, I think the biggest one would be the Darth Vader hallway battle and stuff like that at the end, which was something that you know really was a great way to link Rogue One to Episode Four. Just tell us anything you want to tell us about your experience. I'm only I'm gonna I'm gonna really be very uh, very minimal on this, and That's I fine. will the following. Darth Vader in the hallway would be about the smallest thing that was <laughs> the smallest thing that was changed. Sure. Uh, that that's that. I love when I, I and periodically I hear people talk about what happened on Rogue One. The one thing I always find amusing, and it's also educational, is when you the, the people who talk with the most authority about it, the people who tweet with the most authority or comment with the most authority about what happened on that show, the louder and 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 more confident they are about it, the dumber they look. They are always the most wrong about about it. I will also say, I think I said this once before, so I don't think it's any trouble. I, I think the safest thing, and, and since you have a script uh orientation, it's easier to understand. And this is as far as I'll go. I came on after the director's cut and I have a full screenplay credit. Right. In an arbitration that was obviously highly contested. That for anybody who's in our business who knows actually it, I it, could it, fill in the blanks for any listeners. Okay. So there, there you go. All right. So so in a WG so that, arbitration you need to prove 33% or well, whatever. Content. Yeah. So it was so, it was yeah. an easy arbitration to get a credit on. So it's you know I'm not going to say anything more about that. I don't yeah, know. Any, I'm not trying. I, to I don't know any of the other players. I don't know. I don't know Chris. I don't know. I don't know Witta. I don't know anybody else there. Um, I really don't. Um, I'm, I'm not trying to stir up trouble at all. I'm, I'm actually really just trying to focus on the positive aspect because it, it's a unique. The pos- well, here's the thing. The positive aspect is it's sh- it, it, it it it's a winner. It came out a absolutely. Winner. 
And it, it, you know, if it took a village or it took a weirdo process or it took whatever it took, it's a winner and it's a big winner. And, and that's the real takeaway. And that's always been my takeaway on it from the very beginning is just why watch that sausage being made? Cause it's not pretty. And the man, it tasted good when it, when we were done, <laughs> it did. there's been a bunch of movies like that. I mean, there's a bunch of movies that just shouldn't work and you hear about what happened and, and some of the, you know, some really pure movies come from, you know, come from. I, I guess I'll angle chaos. it back to this. Like you're very good at character driven action and character driven writing and emotional writing. Was there something that you want to tell us about being a light bulb moment for you when you were in that that phase of writing on Rogue One? That was something that was able to ground you and, and kind of show you the light at the end of the tunnel in a way that you wanted to pursue. I do. I mean, it's a very simple thing. Everybody's going to die in that movie. They had that before, right? Everybody's going to die. Wow, what an exciting concept. Okay, so if everybody's going to die, it becomes rather, if you're not influenced by a whole bunch of other forces, if you're not, and if you have some authority to come in and, and do, you know, to clean up, it's pretty simple. You got to really care about them. I, th I think the more you care about them, the more the, 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 more the fact that they're going to die matters. So really, I mean, in the end, that's problem number one. Who are they? Do I know them? Can I care about them? Do they, how do they with each other? Is all of that clean and pure and simple and understandable and graspable and, and timely? That is job one. Everything else flows from that. And many other, you know, movies are all problem solving, but that, I'm not, I don't want to say more about that. That's, that's fine. That's rough. fine. I mean, and, and you are known for excellent character driven writing, which is glowing in Andor. So we're going to get to that right now. When did you first hear about the project? And knowing that it was going to be a prequel, what were your views on it? When, when you kind of first, first came on in the beginning, what could you tell us about the development process? I heard Kathy mention it at one point. She sort of floated it around. And, and I said, man, I don't want to. It, it was five or six years early you know, ago. And there, yeah. the major reason for not being and doing it wasn't just like, oh, I was, try I was also doing a bunch of other things and trying to do something else. And also, uh, I sort of did Star Wars. Maybe I won't do that again. But it was, it was also the fact that there, there was no, how are you going to do a Star Wars television show? How is the economics of that going to work? Because you can't really, you know, as I said to somebody once, an executive once, I said, I can't, you can't give me Versailles and then fill it with Ikea furniture. It's got to be, you know, you got to hit it right from the, from the, from the ground. You got to hit it from day one. Yeah. So the economics never really lined up. I never really believed that they could do it. Um, and, and so as time went on and, you know, this documented now that they, you know, they, they tried a couple things. And at one point they tried one and uh, Kathy sent it to me just as a friend in court. And I sent her back a long memo saying, Hey, I think this is very pro and very slick and very cool, but I think it's just absolutely claustrophobic and limiting. You will not be able to build this out. You're going to be trapped. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a trap. And if you want to do a show like this and you want to have it go out, it really needs to be like this. And the this that I proposed was really, ins at the time, seemed insane and very expensive and very difficult and complicated and me and the rest of it. And so they put that aside and they tried again to do a, a modification of the other one that they had done. And in the end, they came back and opened that, that memo and went, oh, my God, we want to do this. And now they're streaming and we can afford to do this. And so that was a conjunction of those things. And then also I'd had, it was a conjunction for me as well. I'd had these other projects fall apart and I was in the mood to have a conversation at that point. Yeah. And, and, you know, just for our listeners, it's important again, as you pointed out to say that they had not done a star Wars TV show before. So you oh, see no, a document not. like this before Mandalorian even existed. No, no, they didn't have any baby wild. Yoda money or anything. Right, they didn't, right. no, it was, it's really hard to be, I mean, it really is. It seems yeah. short ago. It's only five, six years ago. But if you go back and you see where you were mentally at that point, or you go back and read the memos from that, the emails from that point in time, it's right. uh, it's an entirely and different world. And there's a history. I mean, there was even a, a live yeah. action Star Wars show that George Lucas himself was once going to possibly do, and it was in, there was scripted out, or at least they had a Bible, to my knowledge. Yeah, no, and then it was, a, and then it was abandoned because it was. Just no, and then they tried to turn it into a game. Yeah, then they tried to turn it. Yeah, yep. the yeah the thirteen. What's it? Thirteen sixty nine or what's it yep, called? Yep, yep, yep. And, yeah. and so you know, here you are sitting down to do TV, and you're assembling a dream team. You you have your brother Dan Gilroy. You have Bo Williman of House of Cards as, as another writer and, and Steven Schiff, who was on early on in the show. Right. And that's your writing team. What was it like for you to assemble a writing team and start beating this out in a room and really seeing it kind of come together in that fashion? 
How long it did was you very exciting, that? but we did it in a we did it in a in a in a I guess in kind of a I mean this is an unusual way. I brought in 120 pages of produce and threw it on the table. It was a, there was a full long oh my god this is what I have this is where it's going. Here's pretty much the I think I had written actually written the first two episodes and then oh it was wow. a whole bible that went all the way through and I knew where I was going to end but there was a bunch of soft spots in the middle and were we going to be eight episodes or twelve episodes by that point we figured out what we were going to be so bringing this huge piece of meat. And then we only met, we met in a hotel room. Stephen couldn't come because he was, he, was, he was very ill in London at that time. So it was Bo and Danny and I in the first room. And very importantly, Bo and Danny and I and Luke Hull, the production designer. Wow. All right. My primary co- collaborator, honestly, is Luke Hull. He's well, it shows person. in every single scene, man. He's it's the beautiful. first person I talk to on everything. And Luke and I had been working on the show for four or five months before we even had the room building Ferrex, building the worlds, doing the thing. What can we do? I mean, Lucas, that's my first call. It's interesting in a chicken versus the egg kind of way in which you don't have an exactly completed approved script, but you are designing sets and you are designing the world because you have a rich outline to go from. And it confuses a lot of people when they hear about movies building sets before sometimes the final production draft is done. Uh, We do that all the time. Tell, tell us briefly about that process, because it sounds so strange, but for a writer working with a production designer like that, it gives you a way to see your world. So I think you could probably write better about it. Yeah, well, it would be an incredible luxury to do that in a normal setting. In this case, it's absolutely essential because I can't say, you know, they go to the car wash or they go to the bodega or this scene takes place in the hospital emergency room. In right. Star Wars, every single one of those things is not only... Does it have to be designed? And what's it going to look like? How's it going to work? You also have to say, wow, can we pay for that? And how many times are we going to use that set? And what other set can we redress? And what are we going to do? And we, when we built Ferrex, I mean, Ferrex is a great example because I had to build Ferrex in my mind and a whole ideology and cultural identity for Ferrex. And I had like, you know, there's a map I drew of Ferrex. It's like a cocktail napkin kind of map that we have the original map. And it, it kind of looks like what we did, but I sent that to Luke and we just started building that. We have to build everything. So it's not even out of luxury. It's out of necessity. Yeah. So Luke is in that room and Danny and Bo and Zana, the producer, is there a lot. So the show is actually being built in front of the people who are going to be making it. And the reason we can do that is the room only ran for six days. We only did it for six days, five, wow, six okay. days. And Bo at the whiteboard, you know, Mr. House of Cards showrunner at the whiteboard, because I can't stand on a board. So Bo's at the whiteboard and doing his whole thing. And Danny right. being his inscrutable, hilarious self. I will say in a, in a whole lifetime of spitballing and working with other writers and some great ones. I mean, I did this with Bill Goldman all the time and just all these other people. I've never, I've never been in anything like this. And we did it. We've we did it a second time for this other thing. It is the fastest paced, most exciting, most rude, really rude. Um, I'm not sure how human resources would react to a, a replay of it. Could people just don't are impatient with each other? That's a terrible idea. Well, Things it's interesting. Bad. Actually, tell us about that because because it's okay sometimes to be a bit vain in a writer's room and to really fight. Not vain, ideas. but no, in fact, van- vanity has to disappear. Every any idea that is a is a it, everyone has to be completely. As I said, there are no bad ideas. Everybody has to be completely free to riff constantly. But at the same time, if the idea sucks, it's got to be killed instantly. And yeah. like it, it, and it's just a constant better dealing. And no, 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 no. Let me speak. Let me speak. Let me speak. No, 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 no. You said that before. It's, it's so rude and so energized. It's not for the faint of heart, but it is so, if you're a writer, it's so exciting. They're exhausting. And out of that thing, then a new Bible had to be made. And then, you know, a new distribution of who would do what. And then, and then people go off and do that. And then you're heading towards two seasons, correct? We're going to do two. It'll be 24 episodes by the time. That'll be the whole thing. will be 24. The timeline you're given in the show is 5BY, five years before the Battle of Yavin, the blowing right. of the Death Star and episode four. Right. In those five years, you could have done more than two seasons. But I kind of love that you are just compacting it for something that's hard boiled. Was there ever consideration to do more than two seasons? Yeah, we were going to The original thing was to do the five years, but we a year and a half ago, Diego and I were up in Scotland and we were like, we had a drink. It's like, we just, I mean, when you see what we've done for all 12, I don't think anybody's going to, I think everybody will understand that we would die if we tried to do that five times. Okay. okay. It's too big. Look, he would be too old. Yeah. I got you. And we would just, no one would want to do it. We were, you just, you'd, you'd spend your, you'd spend the next 20 years doing it. You got your show Bible going. How much time did you have to then start writing your season one scripts? Oh, well, I didn't really know what I was doing then. 
So everybody wrote scripts and they kind of wrote their first drafts and the drafts came in and we kind of signed off on stuff and they weren't being paid as well as they probably should have been at that point. And I was embarrassed about, you know, asking them to do much more work and whatever. And I don't know what I thought. And I was going to direct the first three episodes. And, right. and I was in London and prepping and probably super naive about what was going to really be involved at that point. And then COVID hit. Yeah. And, and COVID so- kind of saved the show, really. Well, because it basically gave you a chance to retool. Totally. And also it, it made me, then I couldn't, I wasn't going to come back and direct because I didn't want to die on the show and it was, they wanted to go and who knew and know that you, the idea that you could guarantee that you'd be back in November, there was no vaccine or anything. It was like, you sure. Be. So I just started rewriting and I rewrote myself. I rewrote my episodes and I was like, oh my God, I got to you know, and then you just keep rewriting and rewriting and rewriting and the process goes on and on and on. The second time around is a little bit more sophisticated than that time, but will you direct in season two? No, I, I can't. Okay. There's no time. I don't have the time to do it. I mean, I'm, I literally I'm don't because I love you as a director. So the other side of it is to be honest with you, I need the extra energy and I need the extra viewpoint that the directors bring in. We're so inside our own yeah. shit along the way. And like, and sort of tight, you get tired and you really need like the directors come in and they're really eager to push it and question it and move it. And so it's really good to have that extra propulsion and that extra greed that comes in at that moment. It's very, it's very good that we've been lucky with our directors. I mean, you're a great collaborator. So of course you want some more juice in the room and that makes sense because, because it allows you to, to keep rewriting as you need to and get new ideas as they, as they form, you know, I guess, I guess just briefly about your habit on TV, how much time would you say you spent outlining for the show before you started writing? I would say it's 90, 10, 90% sketching and outlining and 10% actual writing. What would you give it in months for your outline, for doing the six days in the room, going back, doing the show Bible? I can tell you for what we're doing on two, I started two thinking about how to do it a year and a half ago. Okay. Spent that whole summer, six months, seven months before we had the room. So Luke and I, my own work, and then Luke and I for six or seven months before we did the room. And then we did the room last, uh, what, last October. Things have changed and production things have changed. And I will probably, uh, the guys are done now. They're done writing, but I won't finish writing until February. Got it. Because you'll keep rewriting. That makes sense. These guys are all busy and everybody's, you can't keep coming back and saying, hey, you know what? We're going to change this and we lost this and that changes this. And I got to, you know, you can't keep doing that. It's just well, so, so last question before we get into the spoilers, when you sit down to write, do you give yourself a page count to hit each day or do you give yourself a certain amount of hours that you like to hit? No, man. I just, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, the responsibilities that I have are, I mean, I have to worry about every sideburn in the show and every casting decision, like the casting tapes. And I mean, the amount of other things in politics that I have to, I have, I write more memos than I write scripts. <laughs> I mean, seriously, I mean, anybody, I mean, the amount of memo writing and ex- explanatory documents that, that are written vastly outweighs the amount of, of screen pages. I, there's a lot of different components to my but job. But when you're scripting, do you give yourself a, a certain amount of pages or a certain amount of hours? No, I never think of it that way. Okay. I, I know that on September 26, Janusz is, Janusz is showing up in, in, in Pinewood and he better have some scripts to have. Got it. Okay. So I, have to triage, I, have a, I have a mental catastrophe list in my mind and which catastrophe is the one that's the most dominant at that moment is the one I get to. That and, makes sense. Well, so, okay. Podcast listeners, we cannot talk any longer without getting into spoilers. So if you have not yet seen Andor, please press pause. We are going to talk about the first four episodes, and this is being released right after episode four has been seen by the world. So, so you know, right off the bat, you have a challenge here, which is that anybody that's seen Rogue One knows the fate of Cassie and Andor. He, he dies, as you said earlier. And so there aren't as many stakes if you're doing a whole show about a character like that, because you know he's not going to die. I you disagree with that question. Oh, I, please. I totally disagree with it. And so I would tell us this tell what us. happened in London. This, I got this question about this prequel thing. We did it. We did two junkets and we did a junket for two days at the beginning of August. And then I went away, had a little vacation. And on the vacation, we were talking about this issue with, with my son and his friends. And he said, and I came up with an answer. When I came back to London, I, I was waiting for that question to come back. And someone said, well, why should we care? It's a prequel about a prequel. And I go, I didn't say that. I no, said no, but it is, but it's, it's, it's remained to that. It's like, and I said, look, and I realized, I said, we're all going to die. And yet we get up every day and do what we're going to do. I said, the suspension of disbelief within us is, is just so animalistically baked in. You, you, you have some sort of, and that the suspension of disbelief is not just about 
your life and existence, it extends to stories. Why can you watch a movie over and over again and worry about what's going to happen? I think that we ask questions about things afterwards, but I think when we're watching things or involved in them, particularly if they engage us, we suspend that completely. So I never think about that. Okay. I mean, I'm never worried about that. I was almost going to like it to Superman or a superhero in which they're invincible, but you know, the people around them, anything's on the table. And I feel, I feel like that's what is really driving here in which Cassian has people he greatly cares about. I'm going to tell you, people are going to die in this show and it's going to be shocking. (laughs) I'm sure. So, so I mean, like that's, that's kind of what I'm saying in which it sets up this field in which everyone else in the show, nothing is guaranteed. You right. know, so so I, I found that very interesting and, and an interesting place to write from. And you're right about one thing. I mean, it is his the the why and how of his life or what we're really. That's right. In. Yeah. yeah. And, and I think that's a, a, a great show. Now, you have a slow burn and oh, yeah. I, I love a slow burn. So, you know, that's not what people always expect, especially for a franchise like this. But it's completely welcomed. What was it like for you to kind of plot out the slow burn that you're going for, which by the way, reinforces character. So, I mean, like the burn is something that you're not using for action purposes. You're smartly using it to build character. Everything that we do in these first three episodes is going to be germane as the show goes on. And it's really, you you know, you can't cash a check if you haven't put any money into the bank. It's always a battle. And it was, I mean, in in the movie business, it was just a, you know, sometimes it was a crippler. I mean, you just, people would, you'd have to start movies without any kind of, there's just no time and the executives don't get it. You don't want to start slow and you got all those issues in this format. I mean, I hope our first three are are compelling and everybody wants to know what happens next. I, we're very consciously aware that we build into episode three and we're super aware that in episode four, our show changes dramatically. Sure. And it just gets gigantic. And from that point on, there won't be any, there won't, no, and people are going to be hanging on for dear life. Everything that happens in those first two episodes is of vital importance to episode 12, to episode 11, to sure. episode 10, to episode nine. And we'll be resonating all the way through, honestly, to episode 21, you know? Look, you have this great flashback structure of showing Cassian as a young boy. At what point did you realize that you could keep that, that flashback structure going to break us into his 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 backstory, which I thought was really an interesting way to go. It came originally from a pretty mundane motivation. I wanted to explain his accent. I mean, we're doing a show and it's going to be real. I mean, yeah. We're going to you know try and make a real, real, real show. Where, where's that come from? So that was the first place. And then I think once I started sketching Canary and and what would be there, you know, he says I've been in this fight since I was six years old in in uh, in Rogue. That's one of the things that we do know about him. We sort of have to be kind of hewing to the PowerPoint ideas that we have about him in Rogue. Right. And so he's at six years old. So he's six years old. And I got to explain his accent and got back in there and started doing it. And it started to come together when I realized I could link the rescue from Canari with his rescue from Ferex. When I realized I could marry those two things emotionally together, I got very excited then. And that's that's when I really, you know, mapped it out properly. It, it was a great moment. And, and, you know, I was going to bring this up later, but I'll bring it up right now. You're good at, at monologuing here. And it's fascinating some of the stuff that you come up with that plays against expectations when Stellan Skarsgård asks him once and for all in episode four if he's going to join him so he says at the battle of Mimbom, you know I've been through it I don't you know I saw my friends die I don't need to go back there again and Stellan just looks him in the eye you know and just completely trashes what he says in which he's trying to seem like oh I'm a rugged hero and Stellan's just like yeah you were 16 you were a chef you were there for six months most of your friends died because they were just having you fight against each other. And, and you, you ran. Were, and you ran. That's what I was going to say. Like, you ran the most unheroic thing you could put in a monologue. But again, it shows that this is a character who is struggling and struggling and struggling and barely getting by. So tell us about that light bulb moment for putting that into this monologue. That- well, I want to have that. He's the guy. Look, the stuff in Canari, hopefully, and the gift of having Sergio Venus, who, who uh, I just think it's, you know, trying to find a young, I, I just so believe, even watching last night, I just so believe that that's young Cass Diego. I just yeah. I just think he's fantastic. He was. And so you're so emotional to, to see that kind of childhood trauma, right? So he, he, has, a, he has a trauma before the, before we even meet him, the whole trauma. How do these kids get there? And what happened to the parents? And right, the whole, why are they in the forest? You know? and, then, and then he has the secondary trauma of all the, that deep a trauma and then never fully heals. 
And so he's turned into the guy that nobody, you know, he's that guy in your neighborhood that used to, everybody used to love and, but nobody wants to see. And boy, don't get near my wallet and I'm not letting you borrow my car and don't date my sister. And <laughs> nobody wants to see this guy come. And he's, and he's, so he's not just lying to everybody else. He's lying to himself. Sure. This is about a show about somebody who has to grow up. I mean, he's going to grow up. He's going to become a revolutionary. He's going to become a leader. How does it, how does that shit bag become a leader at the end of this five years? That's our show. And I think it's just a great premise. And, you know, just because you said the word shit out loud in the show for the first time in the Star Wars universe, I think there's cursing when they say the word shit. What, was there any pushback on that? Because, you know, they, they've have, they've had all these that. other it's, words. They've had all these other words over the years to talk around it. But this is the first time someone's it's actually. It's funny you say that because last night it's, it's been so long since we put those episodes to bed. And there's some other issues that came up later on that I'm not going to get into. That's fine. But I forgot about that. And when it, when 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 Alex Fern said it last night in the show, I was like, oh, wow, I, oh, we did say that. So uh, I'm guessing no pushback. We don't have to spend not on that time. one. Obviously, no, no. We have okay. you know, our relationship with with uh, Disney Plus has been and, and we know what the rules are along the way. There's yeah, one yeah. point of one little point of controversy that we had later on. But in the end, I think it ended up the way it should be. Ooh, hey kids, I'm jumping in really quick to remind you that Backstory just turned 10. That's right, we've made it a decade. We're here, we've survived, and we couldn't have done it without your help. And, uh, you know, we want to keep doing it. So your support means everything to us. And now is a perfect time to subscribe because we just released our big summer issue. That's right, we have Emmy contenders ranging from Stranger Things Barry, Better Call Saul, What We Do in the Shadows, Station Eleven, and Hacks. We also have summer movies. We have an interview with actor Glenn Powell, who plays Hangman in Top Gun Maverick. We have John Carpenter, the director of The Thing, on its 40th anniversary. Looking back, there are so many great articles to read in backstories. Huge summer issue. There's also scripts to read. I know you'll dig it. If you've never read us before, you could, of course, test drive us by reading the free issue you, which you could find at Backstory.net on a desktop or laptop or via our iPad app, Backstory. And uh, look, after you check us out and test drive us, I hope you'll consider becoming a subscriber. And just to sweeten the deal, I want to offer you discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription. All you got to do is enter that code at Backstory.net, and it'll get you access to both the iPad login and over at Backstory.net net on a desktop or laptop as well. Look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of all these Zoom casts. That's right. You could watch us do these interviews because they were Zooms that I've put on YouTube on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you support my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. But now let's jump right back into our conversation with creator, co-writer, and producer Tony Gilroy about making and or season one. So you're you're building this story and it's well-traveled territory, but the canon itself, since you know Disney had 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 bought Lucasfilm, has has been you know established. Don't mess with certain pinnacles. And you kind of you kind of write around them. It was so interesting to see the character of Mon Mothma still a senator. And you know, anyone that's seen the animated show Rebels knows that she resigns. And again, no, she resigns in she resigns in uh she resigns in two BBY. She's she's three years away from that. No, I know. The battle of the massacre of Gorman isn't 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 gonna happen for two more years, three more years. Right. So but it, but I mean like it was on the TV show Rebels. So we've seen her resignation, well, but we we know that we're before it. We're before so, that. Yeah. So it's so it's interesting to have her still as a senator and basically show the rise to fascism. And that's oh, that's yeah. what I that's what I love so much about the show, in which it's great that you could have Mon Mothma start to act against it and not accept it, right? Decide that, no, we don't need to accept these imperialist ways. There's Also to have a secret life. Yeah, and have a secret life. So, I mean, that's going to be really engaging. But it all comes down to, I think, what you did with Cyril Karn, your yeah. villain here, uh, you know, the, the young man at the company that wants to rise up, who is completely on a fascist bent. And what's... Well, is he? Made, he wants things to be... There's a rule book and he wants people to follow the rules. I don't know if he's a, I wouldn't describe him yet as a fascist. I think he's a careerist. I think he's a, he's, he's just that guy who, I mean, he's not on the spectrum or anything, but he, there's rules. And if we're going to have rules, I want to, I want to follow them. And why don't people play by the rules? He's, he's That's much right. more personal and much, he's not a political person at this point. He's his, 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 his issues are, 
are, are really a, a personality. He likes things to be proper. And But you could easily see it growing by becoming a stern bureaucrat leading to, well, these are just the rules. I'm just following orders, even if the rules. Well, we'll themselves- see if he gets there. Well, we will, his 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 journey and his path is as interesting as anything that we have in the show. I, I'm sure. And, what I and want to wait till you see what happens to him, even in the even in five, six and seven, you're going to be right. Well, he's yeah. kicked. He's kicked out of the company by episode four. So, you know, and he yeah. goes home to his mom and, and he had, and you know, he's sort of will become, you know, he's obviously he's obsessed with finding Cassie and Andor. So there's, that's, yes. you know, he's the man but, who's ruined his life. Yeah. But here's what I see so interesting about you as a writer in particular. Michael Clayton is a film that has criminals existing within a corporate structure right. doing wrong. And it's perfect that you would create this corporate entity that, really is 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 kind of like a metaphor for slavery because although the people are quote unquote free there's not much scope outside of their jobs and the company rules their life and it's a it's an interesting way to go that shows how corporate greed itself of course mirrors what we know about the empire so well, tell us tell us about kind of making tell us about creating the character of Cyril and and how you got there because you are the perfect guy to do it Knowing what you did in my, but Clayton. I don't. I look at him as a, I have great, I have really deep affection for Cyril Carn, and um, and, and it, quite honestly, with I mean, there's some characters that are gonna, they're gonna, they're gonna test my affection as they go along. But but Cyril, I always write him sympathetically. I don't know who he would be in 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 Michael Clayton. I don't know if he he's too he's too pure for Michael Clayton. Everybody in Michael Clayton is con, is utterly confused. Cyril is not confused. He sees the path and and the path is to 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 do the right thing and to everything should be clean and tidy and the uniform should be proper and his boss is just a lazy jerk and and the people below him don't work that hard and the corporation that I'm presenting in Andor is kind of a threadbare, you know, on its ass kind of corporation and and that's what's happening in canon at that point in time in the empire is nationalizing all these corporate planets. That's a that's right. a thing. And so they use what happens with him, his fuck up, they use that as an excuse to come in and absorb to absorb. So he's not only ruined his, his own life and all his careerism, he's also ruined the corporation. It's, it's a complete debacle. He's um, a great character. And I, and I love the linkage between rising. I don't know how I would put him in Clayton. I don't know where he would go. He's too pure. He's, yeah. and, and he's somebody who's, he, he's somebody who's almost an innocent in a way and his innocence and his, his availability and the lack of complexity about what he wants. He wants to be taken seriously. He wants to good job. He wants to contribute. He wants to help the, the empire's, Asking these are the rules, I'm gonna follow them. He's um he's putting a lot of energy into the wrong side, one could say. But uh, one could say that he's he's yeah. he, he's gonna do a lot of wrong betting. Yes, yeah. Okay, the last two questions as I know we're running out of time. What was your biggest left turn? Something that for a while in the writer's room, one day you're like, Oh yeah, this is gonna be a huge part of our series, and you guys completely abandoned it. It's not that it was cut from the series and editing, it was never even shot. So I'd love to hear something that was an idea that you really thought would be cool but then you completely and utterly abandoned has nothing to do with season one or two. And then finally, your the, the last question is what was your toughest scene in these first four episodes and how did you creatively rise to the challenge? So starting the with the first left four episodes, I'd be asked to that. I'd try to answer that. What was the toughest scene in the first? The toughest scene I think is in the first four episodes. I think the toughest scene is the scene that he has with his mother when he comes back with Marva that, that scene where, where he comes back late that night and she's found out that something's gone wrong. And the whole idea of it's complicated emotionally. It has to be a has to be a sort of slow burn and has to take off because you want to really you want to have a hook. You have to introduce her in this scene. We're meeting her for the first time there before the flashback. They also have to do a very tricky piece of business, which is that, and this is another place where canon is really interesting. In a lot of canonical post Rogue One, you know, novelizations and fan fiction and the cartoons. Are, they, someone decided somewhere that there was a planet called Fest that was the birthplace of Cassie and Andor. I don't know who that person was who decided that. I remember right. you know, reading it later on and going, you know, I remember seeing the novelization going like, oh my God. Well, I didn't really dig that that much. That that didn't really work for me what I wanted to do. So the idea of how do we how do we explain that canonical entry so you know how we take care of it in the show? Yeah, you reverse sort of, it. He was a refugee and she put Fest down to try to hide his identity so yeah. they don't come and look for him and to protect him and to protect herself. And it's, and who have we told? And so trying to introduce Marva, 
trying to have the scene packed with all of the danger of, my God, I killed two people the night before and I'm on the run and I don't know and I don't want to tell my mother, disappointing my mother again, and getting that piece of information in and trying to do that all in one scene while you're also trying to have him move to the next scene someone's calling for him. That's a really, that's a tough, that's a tough, a lot. I'm sure there were a lot of drafts on that scene. I mean, it's a great scene and that's a great example of how you could use IP, but work within the system to still be creative and, and get your own your own solutions across. And, and it actually like, helped the scene. It's like, well, who have we told? And I yeah. when, when you get into it, she can say, well, it can be any one of your women. So she starts listing all these women. So you realize, oh my God, he's sleeping around all the time. And he's got all these women. She just approves of it. And he's just, there's another, there's another nail in the, in right. the Cassian failure story here. It's, it's, it's taking um, a negative and turning it into a positive. Exactly. Okay. The limitations are really helped. The other part, I can't really think of anything like uh, there's a couple things that would be utter spoilers for later on. No, that, no, no spoilers. Just, just there's some things that we there's a, there's a sequence that'll come up in, uh, in 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 four, five, and six where it was supposed to be uh, originally it was supposed to be much more populated and gigantic, and for budgetary and COVID reasons we had to make it smaller. Okay. And by making it smaller, we actually changed the story of 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 the planet, and it actually turned out to be a positive, and ended up turning out to, again another limitation. That turned out positive. Well, anything that you are putting your name behind, sir, I'm I'm always down for. I absolutely love what you've done with Endor. I think thank it's, you. It's, thank I think you, it's thank a you. I think it's a great show, and and you could tell that there is just a love for the craft and even the complication of the battle in the warehouse scene. I thought was amazing, and I would I would love to know what that looks like on the page. So maybe we'll talk about that another right. time because there's All so right. much there. But I hope we could talk again after the finale. Tony, thank you so much for your time today. Thank you. And thank you for uh, thank you for all your support. And that's how the Q&A went down. Special thanks again to creator, co-writer and producer Tony Gilroy for being so generous with his time and chatting about the first four episodes of Andor on Disney Plus. Of course, while you're surfing around online, I hope you also check out Backstory Magazine. We just turned 10, folks. We we lasted a decade, and we couldn't have done it without your support. And we just published our huge summer issue. It has Emmy contenders ranging from Stranger Things, Barry, Better Call Saul, Hacks, What We Do in the Shadows, and Station Eleven. We have actor Glenn Powell, who plays Hangman in Top Gun Maverick, talking about what it was like to be in that incredible film and his process. And, you know... He's also a screenwriter. There's scripts to read in Backstory. There's also an interview with director John Carpenter on the 40th anniversary of The Thing. There's so many great pieces in our summer issue, and we're continuing to add to it. So it would be fantastic to have you as a subscriber. And of course, to sweeten the deal, if you want to subscribe now, you could use discount coupon code SAVE5. That's SAVE and the number five, and that will save you $5 off a one-year subscription to Backstory. You just enter that code into the shopping cart at backstory.net and it will give you access to both the iPad app and the website. So look, it would really mean a lot to me to have my podcast listeners and iTunes and Spotify and my YouTube watchers of the Backstory Magazine YouTube page, which is where all these Zoom casts go. That's right. These are Zoom interviews. So you could watch us have these discussions on the Backstory Magazine YouTube page. It would really mean a lot to me to have you consider supporting my passion project. So thanks for considering becoming a subscriber. The Q&A with Jeff Goldsmith podcast is a copyright of Unlikely Films Incorporated in 2022. All rights reserved. Folks, if you want to find me on social media, you could always find me as Yo Goldsmith on Twitter or Backstory underscore Mag on Twitter. You could also find those same accounts on Instagram. So Yo Goldsmith on Instagram or Backstory underscore Mag on Instagram. You could check out our Facebook fan page or you could even send us an email at BackstoryLetters at gmail.com. That inbox gets a little cluttered sometimes. So I apologize if I don't respond immediately, but I love hearing what folks have to say. And I I promise you, I will do my darndest to get to your message. I'm Jeff Goldsmith, the publisher of Backstory Magazine and the host of the Q&A. Thanking you for tuning in and telling you to stay out of trouble. Till next week.